good afternoon everybody. So, we were discussing regarding steam power cycle and uh, <coughs> so far we have seen one variation of or one modification of basic Rankine steam power cycle that is the Rankine cycle with reheat. And we have seen that <coughs> or we have discussed that with reheat we can get more work output out of the same steam flow rate and one cannot tell a priori whether the efficiency of the plant will increase or not because that depends on other operating condition. Now, we will see another, <coughs> another modification of Rankine cycle which is very commonly used in practical steam power plant that is Rankine cycle with regenerative feed heating. So, as the name suggests in this Rankine cycle we will have some feed heating arrangement which will be done <laughs> regeneratively. I will explain what is meant by regenerative heating. Before that let us draw a basic Rankine cycle and let us see why this idea of feed heating or some special method for feed heating was emerged. So, this is the basic Rankine cycle in T s plane we have 1 to 2 heating of <coughs> the working fluid in the boiler, 2 to 3 expansion in the turbine, 3 to 4 is that is the condensation process and 4 to 1 is the pressure rise in the heat pump. Now, we are interested in the process 1 to 2 that is the heating process of the working fluid. Now, here we can see that <coughs> the working fluid that changes its state initially it is in the subcool condition. So, from the subcool condition it goes to the saturated condition then evaporation takes place it transformed into saturated vapor then superheating takes place. So, there are quite a few phases and <coughs> this total process takes place inside a boiler or a steam generator where we are having the flue gas or the hot product of combustion. Now, <coughs> our motto is to improve the cycle efficiency. And Again, if we look back the Carnot, the postulates of Carnot. So, in <coughs> Carnot's cycle, we had isothermal heat addition process and isothermal heat rejection process. In the Rankine cycle, we can see only part of the heat addition is isothermal. Rest of it, in rest of it, the temperature of the working fluid changes continuously. Then again, so that means there is a deviation from Carnot cycle and obviously, we have to pay back for this deviation and the efficiency will be lower compared to an ideal cycle or a Carnot cycle. Now, <coughs> again Carnot cycle is made up of, it is made up of all reversible processes. Now, <coughs> Again, we have made discussion regarding the irreversibilities, the causes which makes a process irreversible. And there I have told that heat transfer across a finite temperature gap or finite temperature difference that causes irreversibility. So, obviously, when the temperature difference for a process, when there is heat transfer is more, we will have higher 
level of irreversibility. If we transfer heat across a small temperature gap, we will have a lower level of irreversibility. Whereas, if we have to transfer heat across a temperature difference which is large enough, then we will have a higher degree of irreversibility. Now, if we analyze the total heating process of this working fluid in a steam power cycle, we can see when the, when the fluid is getting transformed from the subcool liquid state to the saturated liquid state, there we are having a large amount of temperature drop for the heat transfer process. If you assume that, if we assume that uh, more or less the product of combustion is having a constant temperature, though it is not in actual process. So, there also we will see that the product of temperature, uh, product of combustion that will change its temperature as heat transfer takes place. But if we assume that the product of combustion or the heat source that is having a constant temperature, then maximum temperature difference between the working fluid and the source will be at the point 1. And this difference is quite large throughout the process when the fluid is in subcooled condition. So, in other words, in this process when there is heat transfer to the liquid and we need the heat transfer to transfer, transform this liquid to the saturated state, we will have high degree of superheat. Somehow, if we can modify this process, then we can reduce the irreversibility and we can have a better cycle efficiency. It is almost, I mean, <coughs> it is almost taken as an uh, taken as a rule that in a thermodynamic cycle, in a heat power cycle, if the mean temperature of heat addition is raised, then the cycle efficiency increases. Similarly, if we reduce the mean temperature of heat rejection, then our cycle efficiency increases. So, <coughs> the mean temperature of heat addition in a Rankine cycle is low because here in this process, we have to add heat at a low temperature. Somehow, if we can modify this process and this heat addition is not from any external agency, if this heat, trans this heat transfer has to be there, but if we can avoid the heat transfer from any external agency, then we can improve the cycle efficiency. So, this heat transfer can be done internally and if this heat transfer is done internally, it is known as regenerative feed heating. This is heating of feed water and it will be done internally by making some arrangement from some part of the cycle itself, we will take some thermal energy for heating this and we will call it regenerative feed heating. <coughs> that is what we will see now how this regenerative feed heating can be done. Now, let me first draw the draw the block diagram with regenerative heat heating. So, basically we are having the boiler from the boiler superheated steam will go to the turbine. In the turbine, the entire steam will not be allowed to expand up to the exhaust pressure. In between, we will extract certain amount of steam and then the rest of the steam will be allowed to expand to the exhaust pressure of the turbine. This steam will pass through a condenser as usual and then obviously you need a pump for pumping it. But this condensate will be pumped to a heat exchanger where it mixes with the extracted steam from the turbine. Now, the process will be controlled in such a manner so that out of this heat exchanger, we will get 
condensate or water at the saturated condition. You need another pump and with this pump it will go to the boiler. So, I have drawn the cycle with only one feed heating. So, this is called this heat exchanger is called feed heater F H feed heater. So, this is your boiler, this is the turbine, this is the condenser, <coughs> this is pump 1, this is pump 2. Now, <coughs> if I at different point where there is change of property, if I denote them by number, then steam enters the turbine at 1 it comes out at 2, then this exhaust steam is condensed and that condition is denoted as 3. The condensate is pressurized by the pump, That's, that condition is denoted as 4. Then from the turbine in between some steam was extracted, this stream, this steam is known as bleed steam. So, the condition of the extracted steam or bleed steam is denoted by 5. So, steam at condition 5 and condensate at condition 4, they mixes together and we get the mixture at condition 6, which is generally at saturated liquid condition. This saturated liquid at 6 is pumped to be at pressure of the boiler which is denoted by condition 7. And then in the boiler <coughs> from condition 7 to condition 1 the steam is I mean the water is raised to the dry saturated sorry superheated steam and that is done by the heat addition in the boiler. Side by side, we can have the TS diagram. Let us have the TS diagram side by side. Well, <coughs> This is the two phase dome. Let us say, let us take some other color. So, <coughs> we have <coughs> at one steam enters the turbine. So, one here at 2 steam comes out of the turbine, at 3 it comes out of the condenser, then there is pressure rise which is an isentropic path. Then <coughs> See 1 to 2 that is the expansion process of the steam, but in between some bleed steam has been taken out at condition 5. So, let us say this is condition 5. So, here this is the steam which has, <coughs> which has expanded up to point 2, it has been condensed to point 3 and then there is the feed pump. So, this is 4. So, condensate at 4 and steam at 5, they mixes together to produce a condition which is given by 6. So, this point is 6. Then from here, 
again there is a pressurization process with the help of pump P2. So, this is 0.7 and then from 7 to 1 that is the heat transfer process inside the boiler. So, if we put some arrow to show the direction of the process, it will be something like this. So, <clears throat> you see now our heat addition process by some external source is like this. So, this is the heat addition process. So, <clears throat> obviously, we have increased the mean temperature of heat addition. This will have some effect on the efficiency of the cycle and efficiency of the cycle will increase. So, now what we will do? We will do some <coughs> analysis of this modified Rankine cycle, Rankine cycle where we have gone for regenerative feed heating. Now, <coughs> we have to, uh, we have to think, I mean fix some flow rate. Let us say 1 kg of working fluid is passing through this cycle. So, basically 1 kg of working fluid is, this is 1 kg of working fluid is coming out of the turbine uh, sorry of the boiler and the same 1 kg of working fluid is going to the turbine. Here a part of this working fluid is taken as bleed steam or extracted steam extracted steam. So, let us say this part is M. So, rest of the working fluid that is 1 minus m kg that will pass through the turbine and will expand up to the exhaust pressure. So, this is how <coughs> the steam will be divided into two streams, one will be extracted and one will expand. Now, <coughs> if we want to calculate what is the work done during this process or in this cycle. So, work done that is equal to let us say this is net work done if we want to determine the net work done. So, that is equal to turbine work minus W P 1 plus W P 2. So, this is the net work done. W T turbine work that is equal to <coughs> if we see the previous diagram 1 kg of steam that has expanded from condition 1 to condition 5. So, we can write for the first part of it that is H 1 minus H 5. Then 1 minus m kg of steam expanded from condition 5 to condition 2. So, we can write plus 1 minus m H 5 minus H 2. So, this is the work done by the turbine. What is the heat input? Heat input, though there is heating process here also, 4 to 6, here also <coughs> some heating process is there, but this heating is internal heating or regenerative heating. So, external heating is only from 
7 to 1 and here the entire amount of working fluid was heated by the external agency. So, we will have H 1 minus H 7, this is the heat input. So, efficiency we can write efficiency regenerative that is equal to W turbine minus W P 1 plus W P 2 and then heat input that is H 1 minus H 7. Now, <coughs> again depending on the pressure level, one can neglect the pump work and one can approximately write it as W turbine by H 1 minus H 7 that is equal to H 1 minus H 5 plus 1 minus M H 5 minus H 2 this divided by H 1 minus H 7. So, this is the approximate expression for efficiency with a regenerative feed heating. Now, <coughs> if we see, well, if we see this expression, then we can see that we can determine this efficiency once we know m, m is still unknown. So, is it arbitrary? No, it is not. <coughs> there is some method for determining m. So, here what we can see that I have told earlier also that steam is taken at condition 5 and the condensate from the condenser it is going through the feed pump and ultimately it is available at condition 4. So, steam is at condition 5 and the condensate after the feed pump it is at condition 4. So, these two are mixing together and ultimately we are getting the mixture at condition 6. So, this information can be made or can be utilized to find out the mass of the extracted steam, extracted steam. So, if we do that, <coughs> let me write amount of steam to be extracted. So, how to determine it? amount of steam to be extracted. <coughs> so, it is like this. If we see this here, m kg of steam is coming and its condition is H 5, here 1 minus m kg of water is coming, its condition is 4. So, kg at H 4 and then we are getting 1 kg at H 6, right into H 5 plus 1 minus m into H 4 that is equal to H 6. <coughs> so, solving this equation one can determine m. So, solve to get m.
see the arrangement <coughs> which I have shown this is your feed heater. So, the arrangement which I have shown for this feed heater it is known as an open type feed heater. Okay. Here the steam directly mixes with water to produce water or <coughs> condensate at the saturated condition. Now, there are other designs also which are closed type feed heater, but similar type of an, uh, energy balance can be applicable in case of closed type feed heater also. All right. But the way I have shown it in the block diagram, it is for open type feed heater. So, <coughs> we have got or uh, we have made the analysis for uh, regenerative feed heating. So, practical steam power cycle. So, that will have both reheat and regenerative feed heating. All right. Now, if we see regenerative feed heating, we are increasing the mean temperature of heat addition and I told that we are increasing the efficiency. All right. For the sake of simplicity, what I have shown that I have shown only one feed heater, but in practice, if we increase the number of feed heater, the efficiency increases. Again, the incremental efficient increase in the uh, efficiency that decrease as the number of the feed heater increases. That means, the first heat feed heater you add, you will get a large increase in the efficiency. The second feed heater you add, you will get slightly less increase in efficiency. Third feed heater still slightly less increase in efficiency. So, that is why we do not go for very large number of feed heater. So, maximum 3 to 4 feed heaters are added in a cycle. So, that we can get a good compromise between the increase in efficiency and the cost of feed heater and extra piping, extra pump, etcetera. And in a practical cycle, we will have mixture of both open and closed type feed heater. Both the types will be used and we will have <coughs> both closed and open type feed heaters. Now, <coughs> When we are going for regenerative feed heating, we are gaining in efficiency, but we are losing in work output. Obviously, when the entire amount of steam is allowed to expand from point 1 to point 2, we get more work output. But here what happens that up to point 5, we are getting the amount of work output out of 1 kg of steam, but beyond 0.5 we are getting work output out of 1 minus m kg of steam. So, sometimes in some book you will find that they show the diagram like this to indicate that here we get some less amount of work output and here <coughs> only 1 minus m kg of steam expands through this process. So, <coughs> in regenerative feed heating, we are losing in work output that can be compensated if we have side by side the reheat. Again, reheating that also needs some extra cost for piping, etcetera, the plant become too much cumbersome. So, one reheat or maximum two reheats are used, not more than that. So, we will have 3 to 4 regenerative feed heating, 1 to 2 reheat 
and that is what a practical steam power cycle will comprise of. So, <coughs> I think uh, here we will stop regard I mean our discussion regarding the steam power cycle. Basically, we use a Rankine cycle which is the ideally suited for steam as the working fluid. It is different from Carnot cycle. There are uh, particularly the heating process is different from Carnot cycle. It is a constant pressure heating process whereas, in Carnot cycle you have constant temperature heating process and then what we have that the ideal Rankine cycle will not give a very good efficiency. So, we go for different modification of it. Two modifications are extensively used in steam power cycle. One is reheat and second one is regenerative feed heating. Actually, a combination of reheat and regenerative feed heating is used in practical steam power cycle. Reheat will increase the work output for this same amount of steam flow rate and regenerative feed heating will increase the efficiency though there is some decrease in the work output. So, that is what is regarding our steam power cycle. Now, <coughs> With this discussion, I like to go for another topic which is a logical extension of our discussion and now we can switch over to steam turbine. So, <clears throat> steam turbine is the prime mover where steam is the working fluid. With steam is the working fluid <coughs> at the at the earlier days of steam power people had steam engine as the prime mover, but steam engine has got lot of uh, demerits or limitations being a reciprocating type of machine, it is low speed and of course, there will be lot of losses due to friction etcetera. So, that is why though in the earlier days of steam power, steam engine was a very <coughs> people used to think that it is a great invention of engine engineering and lot of use of steam engine was there, but <coughs> with the passage of time slowly and steam engine was phased out. Still steam is used for uh, production of power as a working fluid and the prime mover here is not the steam engine, but the steam turbine. So, basically <coughs> you will have steam generator. then it will go to the turbine this will give shaft power and then this is supply steam and this is exhaust steam it will go to the condenser. So, here steam is at condition 1, let us say the it is P 1, T 1, H 1 and here it is at condition 2. So, it is P 2, T 2 and H 2. 
such that P1 is greater than P2, T1 is greater than T2 and H1 is greater than H2. So, <clears throat> high energy steam generally at high pressure and temperature is entering the turbine. It is passing through the turbine, it is expanding. Why we call expanding? Because at the exhaust we will have low pressure steam and at the same time it will also have lower energy content and in this process it will create mechanical work and then it will work continuously. The steam turbine is such a prime mover that it will work continuously and it will produce power continuously as long as supply of steam is there. So, this is how it is a <coughs> the working of a steam turbine can be expressed with the help of a block diagram. Now, <coughs> basically what we can see that the <coughs> energy of the fluid working fluid which is steam that will be converted into mechanical work. And there are two uh, <coughs> steps by which this energy of the fluid will be converted into mechanical work. So, conversion of energy. conversion of energy. First, there is expansion of steam of steam in a nozzle. So, in the steam turbine we will see that invariably Initially, we expand the steam in a nozzle. So, first conversion takes place <coughs> in the nozzle where the steam expands and what will happen here? We will get a high velocity jet of steam. So, that is what we will get out of this process. Next what we will have is this. Impingement of steam in the turbine bladings. So, here <coughs> basically we will have transfer of momentum. In this case, we will have transfer of momentum. So, by this two method, we will see that the energy of steam that will be converted into shaft work. Shaft work means mechanical work, either it can be the <coughs> output that can be directly obtained as mechanical work or it can be connected to a turbo alternator to get the electrical energy. So, <coughs> this is how we will have the energy conversion in a steam turbine. Now, <coughs> regarding nozzle, we have already studied. So, steam nozzle.
basically steam nozzle can be of two types convergent nozzle and this is one and second one is convergent divergent nozzle. So, <clears throat> in steam turbine either we can have convergent nozzle or we can have convergent divergent nozzle. Convergent nozzle schematically one can represent it like this. This is the convergent nozzle. So, basically there is reduction of area in the direction of flow. This is the convergent nozzle and <coughs> from Bernoulli's principle we know as the area is reducing we will have an increase in velocity and at the same time there will be a decrease in pressure. So, let us say this side we call it call the pressure as P 1 and at the nozzle exit this pressure is known as P B or back pressure. So, the steam expands from P 1 to P B. Now, generally at the inlet of the nozzle the pressure of the steam is very high, but at the same time its velocity is negligibly small. So, sometimes this is also called P s or stagnation pressure and at the exit of the nozzle we call it back pressure. <coughs> now, the characteristics of the expansion phenomenon through a nozzle is different for compressible fluid and incompressible fluid. Let us say we have got some incompressible fluid or, or a liquid. So, if it passes through a nozzle we will see its velocity will increase, pressure will fall and velocity will increase. If we go on decreasing the back pressure the velocity will go on increasing continuously. But in case of <coughs> compressible fluid let us say for any gas or a vapor the phenomenon is slightly different. Initially what we will see if we go on decreasing the back pressure the velocity will increase, but at one point we will find that we are decreasing the back pressure, but there is no further increase in velocity anywhere inside the nozzle. So, we will not have any increase in mass flow rate also. So, that means we are having a decrease in the back pressure, but the mass flow rate is not increasing as if the nozzle has, has got choked. So, this is called the choking condition or critical condition of the nozzle. This happens only in case of vapor or in case of gas. So, in case of steam also we will have this phenomenon. It is like this. Let us say this is the mass flow rate through the nozzle and the back pressure we are expressing it in a non dimensional form P B by P S back pressure by the stagnation pressure. This point is 1 that means at this point back pressure and stagnation pressure they are the same or back pressure is equal to the stagnation pressure. So, what will happen? 
at this point we will not have any flow. After that back pressure is reducing that means we are going towards this direction of the graph. So, what you will find? You will find that mass flow rate is increasing, but at this point let us say you will have P B by P S star a typical value of P B by P S. Beyond this whatever may be the decrease in your back pressure you will not have any increase in the mass flow rate. So, this is a typical characteristics of a convergent nozzle with a compressible fluid as the working medium or medium which is expanding through it. So, this mass flow rate also we can call it m dot star this is the critical mass flow rate. And this ratio P b by P s star is the critical pressure ratio. See at this point what happens? we will have local sonic velocity at the exit plane of the nozzle. The velocity here, the fluid velocity here will be equal to the local sonic velocity. So, if you have a convergent type of nozzle, the maximum velocity will be at the exit of the nozzle and that velocity you can have as high as local sonic velocity beyond that you cannot increase the velocity. So, as the area is constant and velocity maximum velocity is the local sonic velocity. So, you cannot increase the mass flow rate through this nozzle. The maximum mass flow rate through this nozzle is also fixed. All right. <coughs> the sound travels with a velocity and that depends on the medium through which it is through which the sound is moving or the sound wave is moving. Okay, let me write down it at choked condition V at the nozzle outlet is equal to local sonic velocity velocity of sound corresponding to the prevailing conditions of the fluid. So, <clears throat> if it is a compressible fluid, then the velocity of sound let us say at any point let us say at this point it will depend on the fluid properties at this point itself. So, that is why we call it local sonic velocity alright. So, probably you will recall that sonic velocity it is denoted by C and in an ideal gas it is given by gamma R T where gamma is C p by C v, R is the gas constant and T is the local temperature. So, obviously, it depends on the fluid property. Of course, the same relationship will not be valid for steam because it is not an ideal gas, but here also it depends on the local properties of the steam. So, <coughs> so then we can see that when we are using a steam nozzle 
and we are using this geometry of the nozzle that means convergent nozzle. <coughs> we want to have maximum flow rate out of the nozzle. So, what maximum we can have that depends on the exit I mean the geometry of the nozzle and obviously on the stagnation pressure. At the maximum flow rate you will have sonic velocity at the nozzle outlet. So, this is very important to bear in mind that that is how a convergent nozzle for steam will work. So, in this nozzle we will have limitation for both the maximum mass flow rate and maximum velocity. Well, we will continue in the next lecture.